Hi. These are the problems I work on, and these are problems affecting everybody. These are just some of the most recent and current epidemics now circulating in the world. We have new emerging diseases that we didn't know before, for example, MERS epidemic in the Middle East that recently led to an outbreak in South Korea. We have new emerging influenza epidemics in Southeast Asia. We have also re-emerging diseases in areas that we haven't seen them before, never in history, for example, dengue in Europe, chikungunya in the Caribbean. And then clearly we also have re-emerging diseases that really scare us, for example, the recent Ebola epidemic. Now, besides uh, being a concern for the local community which is affected by these diseases, uh, uh, epidemics may also have pandemic potential. And so, under some specific conditions, they may also be able to spread more rapidly and more efficiently into your population, enlarging the region affected by the outbreak, and then sometimes, eventually, even fly out to different regions. For example, like it happened in 2009 for the H1N1 influenza pandemic. So clearly, this is a major problem for our entire population, and infectious diseases are still nowadays one of the ten leading causes of death. Also, uh, bringing together a huge economic cost for their control. Now, let's get to something more recent, and then let's ask more concretely, what are the problems that we face? For more than one year now, we have witnessed an Ebola outbreak circulating in three countries in West Africa. Um, so the first question we would like to ask is, what is the um, spread, the extent of the spread in the local community? And also, how can we best control it? Then uh, we would also like to understand what is the risk that this epidemic would spread globally in our population. And also, if that happens, what are the best measures to, again, prevent it or control it if you are not able to prevent it? So one possible way, for example, could be to reduce this travel from the affected area. Uh, now, how do we evaluate all of these actions? Uh, uh, first of all, one could think, for example, of using uh, past experiences. But uh, historical epidemics of Ebola, for example, the last one we had in the 70s, looked very differently from this epidemic. It was easily and rapidly contained and didn't lead to so many cases like we witnessed uh, nowadays. And also, if we think, for example, at pandemic, the last influenza pandemic was in the 60s. Our world, in the meantime, has dramatically changed. Think about flights from the 60s to 2015. It's hard to think about lessons learned at that time to be applied nowadays. On the other hand, we cannot even use the tremendous progress in medicine and biology of the last century. We cannot run experiments infecting mice in the lab because this would not apply to our population. And we cannot clearly infect people just to see and look how it would spread. So what can we do? Well, the approach that we proposed uh, is to uh, look at the basic elements which play an important role in the diffusion of an epidemic. So we have on one side individuals, then we have how they interact, each interaction could lead to a spread of the disease, uh, how they move in space, this would be relevant, for example, for spatial diffusion, and then clearly we need to describe how the disease progresses into humans and how, uh, what are the chances to be uh, contracted by individuals. Now, the great advantage that we used was the dramatic technological uh, advance and progress of the last 10 to 15 years. Nowadays, we have a massive amount of data that can help us to characterize and also to better describe all of these ingredients. We have very high-resolution uh, NASA satellite maps to 
map and know distribution of population all over the world to a very high resolution. Then we, ha we can map, for example, uh, mobility. Not only we have databases uh, of uh, flights all over the world, thousands of airports, uh, uh, tens of thousands of connection, number of passengers on each connection, but we can also use uh, some additional methods to collect data in an unsupervised way. For example, we can track movement uh, through the use of cellular phones. Um, we can also devise additional methods in order to track face-to-face -face interactions in specific settings. And then, clearly, we need to describe uh, the epidemic. Now, the solution we proposed uh, is uh, called GLIM, Global Epidemic and Mobility Model, and this is what it does. With GLIM, we can analyze how infections may spread globally and assess the best ways to minimize their impact. by combining epidemic models with real-world data. Gleam produces simulations of the global spread of infectious diseases by integrating three layers. The first layer looks at people and their geographic distribution with respect to major transportation hubs. The second layer adds data on the mobility of the people, how they commute, and travel around the globe. The third and final layer adds the epidemic model, which can define complex disease scenarios and response strategies such as vaccination campaigns or emergency travel restrictions. Combining these three layers, Gleam simulates epidemic spread at a worldwide scale. The resulting forecasts and scenario analyses help inform on how best to counter pandemic threats. Visit gleamvis.org to learn more about Gleam. Let's go back to our problem. This was about one year ago. Uh, the actual concern about Ebola epidemic was rising sensibly all over the world in the media. Um, cases were rising almost exponentially in these three countries, and it seemed somehow out of control. So we discussed, of course, clearly there is a, a fear of risk of importation of the disease into other areas. And without being suggested as uh, an important intervention to be applied, several different authorities decided spontaneously to in some, somehow reduce their traffic, their link, their coupling to the affected area. More specifically, some airline companies shut down flights and suppressed all flights to the affected areas. Some African countries decided to um, ban uh, importation and also to close their borders. Uh, now, this is, sounds like a very medieval approach uh, to this study and to the control of infectious diseases. Um, and clearly raised some question and some debate at that time. Now, what we, do with, what we could do at that time with our model was to compare the two situations, a situation in which these interventions were not put in place, and then a situation in which instead we would observe exactly these cuts of flights and exactly these uh, country borders. What would be the effect? How can, can we evaluate and quantitatively estimate the efficacy of these interventions? Are they valuable or not? And the results we obtained uh, are of this type. So these interventions uh, we showed would not have been able to contain the disease at the source. Uh, and somehow, the only advantage that such type of intervention can provide is simply gain time. Now, gaining time in this case is about a few days. So clearly, this is a very short uh, advantage with respect to the time scale, typical time scales of a disease and typical time scales of intervention interventions like, for example, vaccination development. At the same time, uh, international authorities like, for example, World Health Organization and United Nations were strongly claiming for stopping this kind of interventions because they were not helping the management, local management of the epidemic. They were stopping interventions to be put to fly and to arrive to the affected area. They were isolated the affected area. So somehow, uh, what we've seen so far is that 
whenever there is an epidemic emerging, we are dealing with a very complex ecosystem where we have, of course, epidemics circulating. General public is the first uh, actor playing a key role because it's the one that may be affected by the disease. Then nowadays we have scientific community that can provide new knowledge through these tools uh, in order to better inform political decisions and public health interventions. So the example I showed so far applied to the case of epidemic clearly can be applied to different cases. We've been working also on H1N1 uh, pandemic flu, uh, a new, with a new um, uh, emerging disease, uh, we can face, again, this type of problems and try to tackle them through these approaches. So somehow this part of communication is very novel. Models have been sitting at the table of policymakers since a very few years now. Uh, but somehow this is something novel and working. What is uh, still very hard is to communicate this information to the general public. Now, what is the key aspect here? Is that people react. They adapt to something that is affecting them. We saw uh, national authorities deciding to shut down flights. So they reacted to something. They adapted. What happens if it is individuals who adapt in the millions, into the uh, billions of uh, uh, change of behavior. And we know that this has already happened. If you think about 2009 H1N1 pandemic, there was a massive vaccination campaign suggested by most of the governments. And we observed one of the lowest uptake of vaccination ever in influenza vaccination history. None of us was expecting that. So these are somehow unforeseen events, uh, which nowadays, where the general public become an important actor, a privileged actor, so, um, that could lead to uh, strong changes in how the epidemic then evolves. If we suggest vaccination and vaccination is not uptaken, then clearly the uh, foreseen control that we were expecting is not taking place. And this is happening once again nowadays, also if you think about childhood infections. We have a lot of childhood infections on the rise in developed countries because childhood vaccination uh, is uh, um, not so much diffused as it was in the past. Uh, all of these being somehow amplified also by social media. Um, so we cannot consider anymore the general public, individuals, as a passive actor, but we have to include that in a more active role. And whenever they change and adapt, if we want to face and control epidemics in real time, we also need data, clearly, to understand how they change and adapt their behavior. We want to characterize them, include them in a model, and in a feedback loop, loop provide an adapted version of our approaches that could deal with the ever-changing epidemic situation. So the challenge I'll leave you with is how do we radically change and improve uh, communication between modelers, public health authorities, and individuals in order to fight pandemics? Thank you.